Wow, I just finished talking with Drew Benton of Safe House Outreach. He also has his own organization called Project Live Love, which is where I actually met him a couple of years ago. So I went to one of their wellness events in downtown Atlanta. It was basically just a big party um, where we got to spend time with people who are living on the streets, dance with them, have music, um, eat lunch, lots of different things. And anyway, um, I just love how in this interview, Drew talks about how this has really come full circle for him, starting with Safe House Outreach, having his own organization, Project Live Love, which is still um, active today, and now coming back to Safe House. So he talks about that story. Um, he also shares with us different stories of people that he's met through his many years of work. And we start to dig into some of the um, reasons that are underlying behind homelessness and what brings people into poverty at times um, and I think dispels some stigmas as well so um, this is an interview I think you're really going to want to watch and let's just jump right in. Well Drew thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I met you I think it was about two years ago um, with Project Live Love and which we'll dive into but I know that you have a pretty incredible story yourself and so I'd really like to open this up if we can just for you to share your story because you're really in this whole space of living, loving, serving others and you do it through multiple different organizations and ways. So I want to hear how all that is going. Excellent. Uh, well, Stephanie, thank you for taking this time. Let me be a part of this with you. Um, so to kind of back up my, my story a little bit is, um, so I was in, involved in traditional ministry. So I was a student pastor for several years. Uh, kind of back up before that, I grew up the son of a pastor. Um, so I kind of grew up in that very traditional ministry world. And um, long story short, in um, 2003, I mentored under a, a pastor, a predominant pastor here in the Southeast. And whenever we were in this mentoring relationship, we literally went all around the world. At times, we traveled on private airplanes. We wore tailor-made suits that fit our bodies. We ate in five-star restaurants. Um, and it, something about that didn't seem to marry together with Whenever you look into the scriptures, you see the life of a man, or the life of Jesus Christ, uh, who was in fact a homeless man who walked from town to town and lived at the mercy of strangers. Um, and something about those two things didn't seem to line up for me. And so I took a big step back from traditional ministry, not really knowing what was going to be next. Um, at that particular time, I, had, I was married. I still am married, but I uh, had uh, been, gotten married and also had, we had our first child at that time. Um, and so I now have two daughters, uh, but at that time it was just my wife and, and my oldest and I had to make money. You know, I basically was walking away from my career because uh, the way that me mentoring relationship worked is basically once that time was completed is essentially they'd lost me out to be a pastor of a church and that would have been the direction I would have gone. Um, so sort of not knowing what I was going to do or how I was going to make money, my little brother uh, was working for a production agency. And he invited me to come be a part of an event. Um, the, the man who owned the agency said, look, if you'll come and you'll run Spotlight at this event tonight, then we'll, talk, we'll have an interview afterwards and talk about hiring you on. So I, I went to the event and come to find out this whole event is the gala for Safe House Outreach. Uh, I had no idea that's what I was walking into. And so basically, I'm in the back of the room running a spotlight, listening to this awesome organization celebrate all the things they do. Uh, they love God, they love people, and they're showing love to people in very real, tangible ways. Um, where somebody was hungry, they're providing food. When people are thirsty, they're providing drink. When people are uh, without homes, and uh, they help connect them into shelters. Uh, when people were naked, which has happened a few times, um, <laughs> they were able to give them clothes, you know? And so it's one of those things where it was a very real hands-on display of living love. And so that night I met the founder of Safe House. His name's Philip Bray. I took his card. Um, we started hanging out a couple of times and then he invited me to come to Safe House. And just kind of my story, my, just being a very real and transparent is I grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta. I'm a white dude, obviously. Uh, grew up in middle America as far as uh, middle class, if you will. 
um, never really experienced homelessness or extreme poverty on any level, um, because, other than whenever we went to the Braves games, in which case it was like, all right, let's cross on the other side of the street or go faster, you know, ah, run away. Um, and beyond that, then the only other context I had for people living on the streets was what you saw on television or in movies. Um, I think about Home Alone 2, you know, the, the lady with the, the bird lady with all the, the shopping cart and all that stuff, you know, and that was my understanding of homelessness. Um, and so I came up on this parking lot at the invitation of Philip, and I was literally just like blown away. I always tell people I was on homeless man overload. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know how to process it, the sights, the smells, the sounds. I mean, it was just nuts. Um, and so I'm kind of like reaching back, trying to find a wall or a corner to, to hide in. And uh, this guy named Marlon Martin says, young man, come over here and have a seat. So I went and I sat down next to Marlon. And uh, Marlon was a black man. He'd been raised in, in poverty and out from Alabama. Had actually been released from pre prison just recently. Um, at the time, I was uh, 27 years old, I believe. And he was like 55. Um, so we were, you know, um, generations apart from each other. We had grown up in different backgrounds and different lifestyles. Um, but that night, Marlon and I made a, a very real connection. Um, I began to realize this is a man. He's a human. He's the same as me. This, this, in fact, this could be my situation had my circumstances been a little bit different. Um, and and I, I think the best way to say it is that Marlon humanized homelessness for me. He brought a face, a name, a personality, and... I realized I had kind of like a, 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 a catalytic moment of an aha of, wow, you know, this is what these people are dealing with. His story was a very real story and he needed help. I uh, needed assistance to get back to self-sufficiency. And so he and I began a relationship. We still can't have that relationship to this day. Uh, we're still buds. I was the best man at his wedding. Um, and so since that time, I've, I've, I've sort of committed my life to living love. Um, I came on staff at Safe House, worked at Safe House for three years, stepped away to start Project Live Love. Um, and again, I know we'll go through kind of what these or organizations do here in a little bit. Um, but Project Live Love did that for a decade. And over the, so it's been 11 years now of uh, running that organization. And just recently, over the, about eight months ago, uh, came back to Safe House Outreach as well, serving now as their Urban Nation Director, in addition to my responsibilities with Project Live Love. Um, so I'm talking to you today from Safe House, um, which is kind of a neat how things kind of go full circle in the world. Oh, yeah, it totally is. And I think it's so incredible that you, I mean, the experience that you had on the street with your friend was so catalytic that it really changed the whole trajectory of your life. And what a blessing that is to be yeah. able to just deeply understand the people around us and to to have that human connection like you're talking about. So I, I love that story. That's so incredible. And I, I know a little bit about Project Live Love. I know less about Safe House. Um, and so why don't you pick whichever one you want to share sure. first, but we'd like to hear about both. So Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and walk you through Safe House and what we're doing here. Um, we have essentially um, a triangle of self-sufficiency. So if you had to see a triangle, you could imagine layers on that pyramid going up. Uh, the bottom layer of that pyramid is what we call our impact meals. Um, it's, it's food, you know, it's meeting that basic human need of sustenance. Um, and that's our opportunity to, to meet people, to learn their names, to learn their stories. That's where I met Marlon, is that an impact meal? Um, you know, this is in Marlon. I was able to play a role in his life, helping him navigate back to self sufficiency. Um, and so, but that's where we learn people's stories and really, really find out how we can help. Everything we do in this homelessness community, in this space, everything we do is relational. Um, because every single homelessness is as various as the colors of the rainbow, there is no uh, one size fits all stamp. Here's how you fix it. It's everybody is different and they're all their stories are different And so you have to really get to know people to figure out how you can accurately help uh, Sometimes pe people will say, you know, I, I just need money to do this or I need something to do that But if you really dig into the story, you can maybe find the source of what they really need um, So that's where it all begins that our impact needs uh, the kind of layer number two on the on the pyramid is uh, what we call problem solvers. 
Uh, Problem Solvers is, our, is a place where people can come into this facility. They come in through the front door over here, um, and they come in. And, and, and Pastor Joe, he's the, he's the Mother Teresa of downtown Atlanta, incredible man, who I want to be when I grow up, um, connects with people that come to the door and helps them with whatever he can help them with, with whatever they're needing. So, for example, they may come in and say, well, I need a hygiene kit uh, so that I can brush my teeth and have some deodorant. Uh, maybe they need to just use the telephone to call home or to call an employer to seek, you know, employment. Uh, same thing with the computer. Maybe they, at this stage, when, in light of COVID-19, we have a lot of people filing for unemployment, uh, people trying to get Social Security, disability, all these different things that are going on. Um, to, to bigger items, like, for example, when people are on the street, everything you own is on your person or it's in a bag. Well, if while you're sleeping, someone comes along and steals your bag or mugs you and takes items on your person, then you no longer have a driver's license, a birth certificate, or a social security card. So what does that mean for you? That means you're no longer employable. Because the first thing you do when you go to an employer and you fill out that application and they say, yeah, we want to hire you. First thing they say is, I need to see two forms of identification. Yeah. Well, that, that rules you out. Um, so you can't even go to work. You're not job ready till you have these items in place. So problem solvers helps people navigate through getting those pieces back again. Uh, social security cards, uh, their, their driver's licenses or their state IDs. Um, and so these are the things that problem solvers do, does. They do a lot more than that. They can help connect people into housing. We send people to rehabs. Uh, we put people on buses to send them home. Um, there's a whole, you know, family reunification. There's a whole bunch of things that happen in that layer there. Um, kind of the top tier of the, of the triangle um, is what we call our career development program or CDP. Um, and CDP is a space where we help train people. They go through a variety of different workshops. They also come, once they're accepted into the program, they come here at Safe House and they do various tasks around our building. Uh, some of it's janitorial work, some of it's just various projects, administrative things, but it gives us an opportunity to observe them firsthand, see how they work, and it gives us an opportunity then to be able to vouch for them to as we have various hiring partners, we're able to connect people into these opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've been very successful with that program. And from day one, when you come in the program, the first thing we do is put you into housing. We have temporary housing that we are able to provide for you. Uh, that gives you a space where you can take a shower, you can eat a breakfast, pack a lunch. It gives you some stability so you're not in that volatile environment of where am I going to put my head down tonight. Um, and so then you're able to focus more on the trainings, the workshops, and as well as finding your, your, your employment. Um, and so once people graduate the program, we then help them move to permanent housing. Uh, we do that with a budget after we've taught them how to budget, show them how that all works. And, um, you know, it's amazing. Some folks just didn't, don't have the life skills of budgeting or how to think through how to, you know, make sure my money's going to last the whole month or whatever that looks like. So we're able through this program, able to equip people with those tools so they better understand how to uh, navigate for the future so they don't find themselves back in this position again. Um, so that's a little bit about Safe House. Wow. Well, on that line, I mean, it sounds like Safe House is a very holistic type care, getting people back on their feet organization. Um, how many people, I'm just curious, do you, are you able to help at one time through Safe House or how does that work? Sure. So every single night we serve meals and that's where that happens. And okay. we see about 150 plus. Um, in the middle of the, the pandemic, that number went up over 300 at some point in time. Um, because what happened is, is all the restaurants shut down and just your general traffic wasn't there so your panhandlers can't you know they can't they're not getting money um yeah. when the restaurants shut down nobody's going outside with their seconds or with their leftovers and handing them to someone or very real the dumpster divers weren't able to dumpster dive or trash can pickers couldn't trash can pick so our numbers inflated big time um the city's done some some efforts since then to put meals out on the street they take 900 meals out every single day they're actually going to quit that about mid-June, so we anticipate our numbers will go back up over 300. Um, wow. and, and frankly, in light of the just economic status of our nation right now, we are bracing ourselves for those numbers maybe even go over 300. Um, so that's what we do every night. As far as our daytime work, that's whenever we really do all, most of our um, 
our problem solving, our career development program. The career development program takes on cohorts of about 10 to 12. We do those once a quarter. So we have about 50 people annually that come through that program. And then you've got a problem solvers. It varies from day to day. Uh, you know, sometimes there's a line out front getting started about uh, maybe you have 15 people uh, coming in to check their mail. That's another thing we provide is mail services because you don't have an address. Oh, yeah. Um, so we, our, we, we serve as a mailbox for you so you can receive your social security card once you've filed for it um, and all that good stuff. So that, that problem solvers varies, but I'd say we probably help out of any given week, a hundred plus people with those services there. Wow. I volunteer regularly at NFCC, North Fulton Community oh, Charity. Yeah. So yeah, that's up in, well. yeah, North Atlanta there. And um, we often see that people coming in with um, their idea has been stolen or they don't have it in various circumstances. And it is really sad because there's not a lot we can, we can help them with food, but um, it's hard to even help them with other services without it legally and I'll definitely to help them find a job. So I'm just curious, you know, do you operate only within a certain region, district, or can anyone go into your problem solvers program? Anybody can come to problem solvers, anybody. Um, yeah. I mean, we have people that show up here that are from out of state, you know, um, and yeah, we'll help them navigate through okay. these pieces. If we can't send them good. home, you know, ideally yeah. we send them, send them back home, but if they don't want to go home, we'll help them figure out what's next. Yeah. Um, some of our ID, so for example, if you're trying to get an ID out of New York, um, that can take upwards of 11 weeks. Um, there's some places here in Georgia we can get it done quicker for if you are, if you are, um, if you're trying to get a Georgia ID. Uh, but we are able to help people from various regions and other states and all that stuff. That's awesome because I've often been kind of dumbfounded. I don't know what to do and like I'm not even trained to, you know, help in that area at NFCC, but I've always wondered like, how, what, do, what do we do? Like, how do, what do, where do they go? So that, that's awesome. I'm going to keep that in mind if you don't sure. mind uh, <laughs> to, to uh, let people know about that if they're struggling with that. So, okay. So I, I've heard, you know, I've been in this space for a while. So I do understand some of the underlying issues in poverty and leading to homelessness and all that. But I would like to hear just from your perspective, because you do, I mean, you've been in it for so long and you're down there and, um, you know, working with people one-on-one -on -one often. So can you just share a little bit around some of the underlying circumstances that lead people to where they are sometimes? Absolutely. Um, okay, so in homelessness, you say, we say, there, we always say there's a group that you call the lazy, crazy, addicted. Um, that is, those people make up what we call chronically homeless, more than a year. Um, those folks are people that probably found themselves in this situation due to an addiction of some sort, or they are, they have a mental disability, a real true schizophrenia or bipolar or something that where they can't really fit or get along with society as we all know it. Um, and those folks, so those folks find themselves in the situation due to those circumstances yeah. that chronically homeless group makes up about 60 plus percent of the overall um, population of people experiencing homelessness. Um, the other 40 percent of people are people that have found themselves in homelessness and are going to get back out. And they may be in it for, you know, two months, three months, six months, a year, but they're out again. Yeah. Those people almost always find themselves in homelessness as, a, as due to a major event. Um, there, there's a couple things there, okay? One, one, it's from a major event. So for example, they had a divorce, a death in the family. Here's a really good example. A man who's been married to a woman for 20 years, he doesn't know how to financially manage anything because she's been paying the bills. It's his house, his apartment, and then he gets evicted once she dies and passed away because he didn't know how to keep up with that stuff. And so he finds himself out on the streets. Um, that, that's just a, that's one, one very real example of what's happened here to a gentleman even recently. Um, but deeper than that, talking about finances, that is probably one of the biggest issues is that people do not have education. They don't have proper education 
A lot of these folks have grown up in schools that have low funding. They haven't been, um, the more affluent community you get in, the better the schooling because they can hire better teachers, they can hire better principals. As a result, those kids get placed in better schools even on, uh, beyond high school. Um, alternatively, when you go into a, a impoverished area, you've got low budgets, low ability to hire the best teachers, low ability to get the best training resources. So people end up coming out with very, very low education. Um, and with low education is, unfortunately, it leads to mismanagement of monies, not understanding how to budget, not understanding how to, um, you know, even for that matter, how to run a calendar, how to keep your life in order. There's just yeah. a lot of things that go with it. Um, so I, I personally think that those are some of the systemic things that lead to homelessness is, is low education, major trauma events, um, and then additionally is people that are dealing with addiction or a mental disability of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the, um, underlying generational poverty too? I know that plays a huge part into it. Um, do you see a lot of that in what you're like, where you're working too? Yes. Um, and I would, I would equate that also to, so the generational poverty, okay, so you are in a community, you're born into a community of two parents that have low to no education, and now you're in an environment where you're going to a school that has low resources, unequipped teachers, et cetera. Yeah, that's gonna, that is gonna become a secular, secular thing it's just going to continue to happen. It's a cycle that's going to continue to repeat itself because then this kid's going to go through, he may, may or may not make it through high school. He's going to drop out or he's going to graduate, but with a low, uh, you know, capacity of, of education comparatively to someone who graduates from an affluent community. Um, maybe they graduated with honors, you know, and they, they're all AP classes and they're going to, you know, I mean, I'll, my daughter, for example, you know, we live in the, the suburbs of Atlanta. Uh, she's graduated 12th, and, uh, 12th highest in her class, you know, and I equate that to the education she's received from where, where we are. Um, yeah. And so I think that the generational poverty bleeds the biggest issue of that because people can break out of poverty, meaning like, I don't know, let's say, for example, you you're a sports star, you get, you know, I don't know, there's a, there's a variety of ways people can break out of poverty. But it, even at that, like, it's the education, if they even, you know, like, how many millionaires have hit it big? And, and then I'm not even joking when I say this is when I worked at Safe House last time, we had an NBA basketball player on our staff here that only became on our staff because we found him on the street addicted to crack cocaine, not a penny mm -hmm. to his name. And we helped him go and get recovery. And then he was able to come back, get on staff and help other people get recovery. To this day, yeah. the man has no money. But my point is, is that he was a millionaire at one time. And yeah. so it's like, if you are a millionaire and you have bad education, bad ways of thinking, you're still susceptible to falling into these same traps that uh, a lot of others have. So I didn't mean to <laughs> kind of got derailed on that answer. No, that's awesome. <laughs> this is the type of conversation that I'm looking to have because it helps us understand more about these particular issues. And I think even, you know, what you're saying is that there's always, in my mind, there's always some reason for someone that's homeless. And I think there's a lot of stigma that maybe they are just addicted, crazy, whatever those things. But I also know and what I've learned that even if they are addicted or they do have a mental issue that that has spurred from something else, right? Like you're sure. probably born with a mental issue and you can't help it. I have sympathy for that. Or people that are addicted, maybe they're addicted because they were abused as a child sure. or things like that. And so, um, yeah, that's why I wanted to dig into this with you because I think you bring a really unique perspective and um, I, I like the stories that you're sharing. So that's great. <laughs> uh, so now why don't we transition a little bit um, into Project Live Love? Cause that's actually where I met you. I was at, went to one of your events in downtown Atlanta where we were just, it was just a party to spend yeah. time with people that were homeless on the streets. Um, and we were dancing and having food together. And um, 
it was just a really beautiful time. Um, so can you just share a little bit about the mission of Project Live Well? Absolutely. So um, you were probably at one of our Live Well events, which yes. is our, essentially it's a health day. Uh, we bring in doctors, chiropractors, um, we have, uh, everybody gets lunch. Like you described, we have a DJ and dance floor because when you're living on the streets, you har almost hardly ever get to go just party. Um, yeah. you know, that is in the sense of with live music and fun like that. Um, and so, and then in addition to that, everybody receives a hygiene kit. We have barbers and, and, um, and hairstylists that come cut hair for folks. Uh, and it's a whole event. And so, uh, we typically do that event in May each year, but this year has been different. Um, so we were, we were looking at October to do it, and then we're probably going to do it again in May next year. So we're going to try and do two each year now. Um, in addition to the Live Well event, we also have a program called 3 We Go uh, that refers to the temperatures. So 3-0, like when, that means whenever the temperatures go below freezing, so 31, 30, um, then we come out. So we wait till it goes below freezing. And what we do is we go out on the streets and we hand out blankets, hand warmers, hat, socks, and gloves. Uh, we have routes where we know people tend to congregate around the city. And so like a lot of people will stay in groups. There's safety in numbers, so they'll stay in a group. Yeah. So we know kind of where people tend to hang out. So we go around and try and connect with everybody, help them get to the night's warm and safe. Um, so that's a little bit about Project Live Love. We also have these really cool stickers. Uh, one of our things is that, one of my things is that I'm always trying to push the message of live love into the culture. Um, yeah. we, we call it the propaganda of our organization. Um, and we do that through stickers, t-shirts, a whole bunch of ways. We've got a couple of, uh, of murals and things. Um, and so we're always trying to push that message into the culture. You know, this is, this is um, particular to this given moment right now. So I don't know how this is going to play for the podcast in the future, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, in light of all the things that are happening with the disrest, with the rioting and the, um, yeah. the protests and so forth that are happening across the, our city right now and beyond. I mean, it's, um, when you go out the door, you'll hear, you hear helicopters up there going because they're all videoing. And it, now more than ever, I believe the message of live love has to get out there. Uh, we yeah. have to push this idea of loving each other rather than this hatred, this anger, this frustration. Um, we got to turn the corner somewhere um, yeah. into a, becoming a, a culture of love. And I, don't, I genuinely believe that that's the only thing that's going to heal our nation with where we are today. Um, so. I agree. Exactly. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's what these video interviews really are all about or the podcasts are all about um, is being able to dig under the skin a little bit and understand each other so that we can heal our hearts inside and come to love each other more. So I think that's exactly what your message is. And I love it. I, I think that's perfect. Um, it's exactly what I believe we need as well. So that's amazing. Okay. So I know we could probably talk for a long time and maybe we'll do this again. I don't know. I think it's, it's been pretty fun to talk to you. Um, and you have a lot to share. So, but before we kind of wrap things up, can you share a little bit about how we can help if, um, we really feel called to, um, what you're doing and you know i know that right now is is a sensitive time too for people so and by no means it's not a you know expectation or anything like that but i think there are people that are seeing the brokenness happen around them and that are more interested in getting involved at the moment so how can we do that absolutely uh, so if you're interested in joining our three we go program or participating in one of those health days uh, you can jump over to projectlivelove.com. From there, you can sign up to receive our alarms for the for the three O we go program. You'll just click up top, and you'll see it says programs. Select three O we go, and from there, you can sign up to receive our text alarms. Uh, you text the word alarm to six three five six six. You'll then receive the alarms when they go out. You're not obligating yourself to say I'm going out. You're saying I want to know what nights you're going out. Um, and so once you've signed up for that, whenever the uh, night of a coming freeze is coming, we'll send out that text message. The first 21 people to respond can come out with us. Um, that program usually runs from November through uh, March. And so this winter, obviously, will be the time for when that will be active. Um, 
right now we don't have a hard date for our health days. So we're just going to, I'll just kind of leave that where it is. Uh, beyond that though, you can, you guys can always go over to safehouseoutreach.org. Uh, from Safe House, I'd recommend that you make financial donations there. Um, I'm not asking for financial donations for Project Live Love at this stage because I've, I've recently taken this position with Safe House and I want to push efforts into Safe House. Um, yeah. I think that my in game, my long term is going to be working out of this organization. Um, we've even been talking about merging the two in some way. So if you want to make a financial donation, do that to over through safehouseoutreach.org. There's also a volunteer tab you can select. Um, we have an upcoming orientation on June 20th, I believe, and then we have another one in July. Uh, we plan to bring volunteers back. Uh, we're already bringing them back little by little, some of the ones that have been with us, uh, but we're planning to bring back new volunteers starting in July. Um, so okay. we'd be happy to have anybody come on and, and sign up to go through orientation. That's the first step. Once you come through orientation, You'll learn more about who we are, what we do, how we go about doing what we do. Um, and then from there, you can find out where the opportunities are to plug in. Awesome. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you for all of that. Um, and last question I'd like to ask is what's one thing that you'd like people to understand about homelessness in Atlanta or just America in general? Yeah, so that's a good question. One thing that I would love for people to understand, um, what, what we're trying to do here at Safe House, at the lead of our, C our now CEO, uh, Josh Bray, is we're trying to eradicate the term homeless. Um, mm -hmm. We say people living in homelessness, and we call homelessness a thing, um, or we'll say people living on the streets, you know, um, the homeless community. You know, we, we, we've tried to sub out calling somebody homeless meaning right so because the moment you say somebody is homeless you've placed an identity onto that person um which makes you perceive them differently but then more importantly is it makes themselves perceive themselves differently and yes. whenever they take on the stigma of i am homeless they see themselves through a whole different light than seeing themselves as a whole person who's dealing with homelessness yes. Yeah. They're in a situation, that's not who they are. Uh, they're two distinct things. And so that's something we're trying to push into the culture. Um, it'll take decades for people to stop using the word homeless. Uh, but you see it, you see how it translates um, into other subject matters. For example, they're starting in a, from a medical perspective. People will say that person is dealing with bulimia. That person yeah. is dealing with alcoholism. They're not an alcoholic, they're not a bulimic, they're not anorexic, they are dealing with these things, um, which is a very different perspective than owning, I'm an alcoholic. You know, it's just a different way of going about it. Um, so that's something that we're trying to, to, to do as well. Uh, every time I hear the word homeless nowadays, I kind of go, oh, it cringes a little. Uh, but you know, that's, that's just the way it is and it'll take time for that word to, to move out of our culture. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think I just said it maybe when I asked the question, it's the type of thing that it's ingrained into our language and it's maybe not that we're thinking long enough to understand what that really means. And you don't mean it when you're saying it, but it's true. It, it does place an identity and it takes away the dignity, I think, of yes. the human person. And I, I know that also just like in the um, immigration world too that um, El Refugio is an organization that just a couple of weeks ago we launched a video interview on and the same thing we don't want to be saying these refugees um, immigrants or just other words that are more um, um, positively affirming, I guess. So yeah, I completely understand that. And that's, that's a great perspective. I'm going to start to try to use that as well. And maybe we can push that out there. That's it. I mean, you'll, you'll, you over the next few weeks, you're going to be like, ah, oh, shoot, I said it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, 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 it, it, it's in, like you said, it's ingrained in the culture. I mean, this is what, this is how people refer to the community of people yeah. living in homelessness is the homeless, you know, and that's just the way it always has been. But I think it's something that if we, if we get intentional, we can change in time. Right. I think if we change it in our hearts, start changing it in our mind, that's like the biggest piece. And then ultimately it'll, your actions will change too. So 
Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Drew, this has been just an honor to talk to you. I really, really thank you for all the time you spent. And um, this has been a really in-depth, I think, fruitful discussion, at least from my perspective. So I'm really glad we had the chance to chat and uh, I look forward to seeing in touch. Absolutely. Thanks for, for having me on. I love what Drew said towards the end about living to show love and having love be part of everything that you do. And I really personally align with that and believe that too. And it sounds overly simplified, but I really do believe when you peel back the layers, love truly is a common denominator that can start to heal some of the social issues that we deal with around the world and in our country. So anyway, I really align with that personally. It's part of the messaging that Love Light Stories is all about. It's in the name even. Um, and so if this interview really touched you, um, which I hope it did, um, please consider sharing it with someone that you care about and it, leave your comments below. I'd love to continue the conversation there. And as always, a new video will be coming out on Tuesday. And if you go to lovelightstories.com, you can sign up to receive an email the next time a video comes out. So until then, I'll be thinking of you, praying for our world, and we'll see you next time.